Org. Alan Quatermain by H. Ryder Haggard. Chapter 7 A Slaughter Grim and Great. Then there was a pause, and we stood there in the chilly, silent darkness, waiting till the moment came to start. It was, perhaps, the most trying time of all, that slow, slow quarter of an hour. The minutes seemed to drag along with leaden feet, and the quiet, the solemn hush that brooded over all, big as it were with a coming fate, was most oppressive to the spirits. I once remember having to get up before dawn to see a man hanged, and I then went through a very similar set of sensations. Only, in the present instance, my feelings were animated by that more vivid and personal element which naturally appertains rather to the person to be operated on than to the most sympathetic spectator. The solemn faces of the men, well aware that the short passage of an hour would mean for some, and perhaps all of them, the last great passage to the unknown or oblivion, the baited whispers in which they spoke, even Sir Henry's continuous and thoughtful examination of his woodcutter's axe, and the fidgety way in which Good kept polishing his eyeglass, all told the same tale of nerves stretched pretty nigh to breaking point. Only Umslopogaas, leaning as usual upon Inkosikas and taking an occasional pinch of snuff, was to all appearance perfectly and completely unmoved. Nothing could touch his iron nerves. The moon went down. For a long while she had been getting nearer and nearer to the horizon. Now she finally sank and left the world in darkness, save for a faint gray tinge in the eastern sky that palely heralded the dawn. Mr. Mackenzie stood, watch in hand, his wife clinging to his arm and striving to stifle her sobs. Twenty minutes to four, he said. It ought to be light enough to attack at twenty minutes past four. Captain Good had better be moving. He will want three or four minutes to start. Good gave one final polish to his eyeglass nodded to us in a jocular sort of way, which I could not help feeling it must have cost him something to muster up, and, ever polite, took off his steel-lined cap to Mrs. Mackenzie and started for his position at the head of the corral, to reach which he had to make a detour by some paths known to the natives. Just then one of the boys came in, and reported that everybody in the Maasai camp, with the exception of the two sentries who were walking up and down in front of their respective entrances, appeared to be fast asleep. Then the rest of us took the road. First came the guide, then Sir Henry, Umslopogas, the Wakwafi Askari, and Mr. Mackenzie's two mission natives armed with long spears and shields. I followed immediately after with Alphonse and five natives, all armed with guns, and Mr. Mackenzie brought up the rear with the six remaining natives. The cattle kraal, or the Maasai were camped, lay at the foot of the hill on which the house stood, or, roughly speaking, about 800 yards from the mission buildings. The first 500 yards of this distance we traversed quietly indeed, but at a good pace. After that we crept forward as silently as a leopard on his prey, gliding like ghosts from bush to bush and stone to stone. When I had gone a little way I chanced to look behind me, 
and saw the redoubtable Alphonse staggering along with white face and trembling knees, and his rifle, which was at full cock, pointed directly at the small of my back. Having halted and carefully put the rifle at safety, we started again, and all went well till we were within one hundred yards or so of the corral, when his teeth began to chatter in the most aggressive way. "'If you don't stop that, I will kill you,' I whispered savagely, for the idea of having all our lives sacrificed to a tooth-chattering cook was too much for me. I began to fear that he would betray us, and heartily wished we had left him behind. "'But, monsieur, I cannot help it,' he answered. "'It is the cold.' Here was a dilemma, but fortunately I devised a plan. In the pocket of the coat I had on was a small piece of dirty rag that I had used some time before to clean a gun with. "'Put this in your mouth,' I whispered again, giving him the rag. "'And if I hear another sound, you are a dead man.' I knew that that would stifle the clatter of his teeth. I must have looked as if I meant what I said, for he instantly obeyed me, and continued his journey in silence. Then we crept on again. At last we were within fifty yards of the corral. Between us and it was an open space of sloping grass, with only one mimosa bush, and a couple of tussocks, of a sort of thistle for cover. We were still hidden in fairly thick bush. It was beginning to grow light. The stars had paled, and a sickly gleam played about the east and was reflected on the earth. We could see the outline of the kraal clearly enough, and could also make out the faint glimmer of the dying embers of the Maasai campfires. We halted and watched, for the sentry we knew was posted at the opening. Presently he appeared, a fine, tall fellow, walking idly up and down, within five paces of the thorn-stopped entrance. We had hoped to catch him napping, but it was not to be. He seemed particularly wide awake. If we could not kill that man, and kill him silently... We were lost. There we crouched and watched him. Presently Umslopogaas, who was a few paces ahead of me, turned and made a sign, and next second I saw him go down on his stomach like a snake, and taking an opportunity when the sentry's head was turned, began to work his way through the grass without a sound. The unconscious sentry commenced to hum a little tune, and Umslopogaas crept on. He reached the shelter of the mimosa bush, unperceived, and there waited. Still the sentry walked up and down. Presently he turned and looked over the wall into the camp. Instantly the human snake who was stalking him glided on ten yards, and got behind one of the tussocks of the thistle-like plant, reaching it as the Elmoran turned again. As he did so, his eye fell upon this patch of thistles, and it seemed to strike him that it did not look quite right. He advanced a pace towards it, halted, yawned, stooped down, picked up a little pebble, and threw it at it. It hit Umslopogas upon the head, "'luckily not upon the armor shirt. "'Had it done so, the clink would have betrayed us. "'Luckily, too, the shirt was browned and not bright steel, "'which would certainly have been detected. "'Apparently satisfied that there was nothing wrong, "'he then gave over his investigations "'and contented himself with leaning on his spear "'and standing gazing idly at the tuft.' For at least three minutes did he stand thus, plunged, apparently, in a gentle reverie. And there we lay, in the last extremity of anxiety, 
expecting every moment that we should be discovered, or that some untoward accident would happen. I could hear Alphonse's teeth going like anything on the oiled rag, and turning my head round made an awful face at him. But I am bound to state that my own heart was at much the same game as the Frenchman's castanets, while the perspiration was pouring from my body, causing the washed leather-lined shirt to stick to me unpleasantly. And altogether I was in the pitiable state known by schoolboys as a blue fright. At last the ordeal came to an end. The sentry glanced at the east, and appeared to note with satisfaction that his period of duty was coming to an end, as indeed it was, once and for all, for he rubbed his hands and began to walk again briskly to warm himself. The moment his back was turned, the long black snake glided on again and reached the other thistle tuft, which was within a couple of paces of his return beat. Back came the sentry and strolled right past the tuft, utterly unconscious of the presence that was crouching behind it. Had he looked down, he could scarcely have failed to see, but he did not do so. He passed, and then his hidden enemy erected himself, and with outstretched hand followed in his tracks. A moment more, and just as the El Moran was about to turn, the great Zulu made a spring, and in the growing light we could see his long, lean hands close round the Masai's throat. Then followed a convulsive twining of the two dark bodies, and in another second I saw the Masai's head bent back, and heard a sharp crack, something like that of a dry twig snapping, and he fell down upon the ground, his limbs moving spasmodically. Umslopogas had put out all his iron strength and broken the warrior's neck. For a moment he knelt upon his victim, still gripping his throat, till he was sure that there was nothing more to fear from him, and then he rose and beckoned to us to advance, which we did on all fours, like a colony of huge apes. On reaching the corral, we saw that the Maasai had still further choked this entrance, which was about ten feet wide, no doubt in order to guard against attack, by dragging four or five tops of mimosa trees up to it. So much the better for us, I reflected. The more obstruction there was, the slower they would be able to come through. Here we separated, Mackenzie and his party creeping up under the shadow of the wall to the left, while Sir Henry and Umslopogas took their stations, one on each side of the thorn fence, the two spearmen and the Ascari lying down in front of it. I and my men crept on up the right side of the corral, which was about fifty paces long. When I was two-thirds up, I halted, and placed my men at distances of four paces from one another, keeping Alphonse close to me, however. Then I peeped for the first time over the wall. It was getting fairly light now, and the first thing I saw was the white donkey, exactly opposite to me, and close by it I could make out the pale face of little Flossie, who was sitting as the lad had described some ten paces from the wall. Round her lay many warriors, sleeping. At distances all over the surface of the corral were the remains of fires, round each of which slept some five-and-twenty Maasai, for the most part gorged with food. Now and then a man would raise himself, yawn, and look at the east, which was turning primrose, but none got up. I determined to wait another five minutes, both to allow the light to increase so that we could make better shooting and to give Good and his party, of whom we could see or hear nothing, every opportunity to make ready. 
the quiet dawn began to throw her ever-widening mantle over plain and forest and river. Mighty Kenya, wrapped in the silence of eternal snows, looked out across the earth, till presently a beam from the unrisen sun lit upon his heaven-kissing crest and purpled it with blood. The sky above grew blue and tender as a mother's smile. A bird began to pipe his morning song, and a little breeze passing through the bush shook down the dewdrops in millions to refresh the waking world. Everywhere was peace and the happiness of a rising strength. Everywhere save in the heart of cruel man. Suddenly, just as I was nerving myself for the signal, having already selected my man on whom I meant to open fire, a great fellow sprawling on the ground within three feet of little Flossie, Alphonse's teeth began to chatter again like the hoofs of a galloping giraffe making a great noise in the silence. The rag had dropped out in the agitation of his mind. Instantly a Maasai within three paces of us woke, and sitting up gazed about him, looking for the cause of the sound. Moved beyond myself, I brought the butt end of my rifle down onto the pit of the Frenchman's stomach. This stopped his chattering, but as he doubled up, he managed to let off his gun in such a manner that the bullet passed within an inch of my head. There was no need for a signal now. From both sides of the corral broke out a waving line of fire, in which I myself joined, managing with a snapshot to knock over my Maasai by Flossie, just as he was jumping up. Then from the top end of the corral there rang an awful yell, in which I rejoiced to recognize Good's piercing notes rising clear and shrill above the den. And in another second followed such a scene as I have never seen before nor shall again. With a universal howl of terror and fury, the brawny crowd of savages within the corral sprang to their feet, many of them to fall again beneath our well-directed hail of lead before they had moved a yard. For a moment they stood undecided, and then, hearing the cries and curses that rose unceasingly from the top end of the corral, and bewildered by the storm of bullets, they, as by one impulse, rushed down towards the thorn-stopped entrance. As they went, we kept pouring our fire with terrible effect into the thickening mob as fast as we could load. I had emptied my repeater of the ten shots it contained, and was just beginning to slip in some more when I bethought me of little Flossie. Looking up, I saw that the white donkey was lying kicking, having been knocked over either by one of our bullets or a Maasai spear thrust. There were no living Maasai near, but the black nurse was on her feet, and with a spear cutting the rope that bound Flossie's feet. Next second she ran to the wall of the corral and began to climb over it, an example which the little girl followed. But Flossie was evidently very stiff and cramped, and could only go slowly. And as she went, two Maasai flying down the corral caught sight of her, and rushed towards her to kill her. The first fellow came up just as the poor little girl, after a desperate effort to climb the wall, fell back into the corral. Up flashed the great spear and as it did so, a bullet from my rifle found its home in the holder's ribs, and over he went like a shot rabbit. But behind him was the other man, and alas, I had only that one cartridge in the magazine. Flossie had scrambled to her feet, and was facing the second man, who was advancing with raised spear. I turned my head aside, and felt sick as death. I could not bear to see him stab her. Glancing up again to my surprise, I saw the Messiah's spear lying on the ground, 
while the man himself was staggering about with both hands to his head. Suddenly I saw a puff of smoke proceeding apparently from Flossie, and the man fell down headlong. Then I remembered the Derringer pistol she carried, and saw that she had fired both barrels of it at him, thereby saving her life. In another instant she had made an effort, and assisted by the nurse, who was lying on the top, had scrambled over the wall, and I knew that she was, comparatively speaking, safe. All this takes time to tell, but I do not suppose that it took more than fifteen seconds to enact. I soon got the magazine of the repeater filled again with cartridges, and once more opened fire, not on the seething black mass which was gathering at the end of the corral, but on fugitives who bethought them to climb the wall. I picked off several of these men, moving down towards the end of the corral as I did so, and arriving at the corner, or rather the bend of the oval, in time to see, and by means of my rifle to assist in, the mighty struggle that took place there. By this time, some two hundred Maasai, allowing that we had up to the present accounted for fifty, had gathered together in front of the thorn-stopped entrance, driven thither by the spears of Good's men, whom they doubtless supposed were a large force instead of being but ten strong. For some reason it never occurred to them to try and rush the wall, which they could have scrambled over with comparative ease. They all made for the fence, which was really a strongly interwoven fortification. With a bound, the first warrior went at it, and even before he touched the ground on the other side, I saw Sir Henry's great axe swing up and fall with awful force upon his feather headpiece, and he sank into the middle of the thorns. Then with a yell and a crash, they began to break through as they might, and ever as they came, the great axe swung, and in Kosikas flashed, and they fell dead, one by one, each man thus helping to build up a barrier against his fellows. Those who escaped the axes of the pair fell at the hands of the Askari, and the two mission Kafirs, and those who passed scatheless from them were brought low by my own and Mackenzie's fire. Faster and more furious grew the fighting. Single Maasai would spring upon the dead bodies of their comrades and engage one or the other of the axemen with their long spears. But, thanks chiefly to the male shirts, the result was always the same. Presently there was a great swing of the axe, a crashing sound, and another dead Maasai. That is, if the man was engaged with Sir Henry. If it was Umslopogas that he fought with, the result indeed would be the same. But it would be differently attained. It was but rarely that the Zulu used the crashing double-handed stroke. On the contrary, he did little more than tap continually at his adversary's head, pecking at it with the pole-axe end of the axe as a woodpecker pecks at rotten wood. End note. As I think I have already said, one of Umslopogas' Zulu names was the woodpecker. I could never make out why he was called so until I saw him in action with Nkosikas, when I at once recognized the resemblance. Alan Quatermain Presently a peck would go home, and his enemy would drop down with a neat little circular hole in his forehead or skull, exactly similar to that which a cheese scoop makes in a cheese. He never used the broad blade of the axe, except when hard-pressed, or when striking at a shield. He told me afterwards that he did not consider it sportsmanlike. Good and his men were quite close by now, and our people had to cease firing into the mass 
for fear of killing some of them. As it was, one of them was slain in this way. Mad and desperate with fear, the Maasai, by a frantic effort, burst through the thorn fence and piled up dead, and sweeping Curtis, Umslopogas, and the other three before them into the open. And now it was that we began to lose men fast. Down went our poor Skari, who was armed with the axe, a great spear standing out a foot behind his back. And before long the two spearsmen who had stood with him went down too, dying fighting like tigers. And others of our party shared their fate. For a moment I feared the fight was lost. Certainly it trembled in the balance. I shouted to my men to cast down their rifles and to take spears and throw themselves into the melee. They obeyed, their blood being now thoroughly up, and Mr. Mackenzie's people followed their example. This move had a momentary good result, but still the fight hung in the balance. Our people fought magnificently, hurling themselves upon the dark mass of El Moran, hewing, thrusting, slaying, and being slain. And ever above the din rose Good's awful yell of encouragement as he plunged to wherever the fight was thickest. And ever, with an almost machine-like regularity, the two axes rose and fell, carrying death and disablement at every stroke. But I could see that the strain was beginning to tell upon Sir Henry, who was bleeding from several flesh wounds. His breath was coming in gasps, and the veins stood out in his forehead like blue and knotted cords. Even Umslopogas, man of iron that he was, was hard-pressed. I noticed that he had given up woodpecking, and was now using the broad blade of Inkosikas, browning his enemy whenever he could hit him, instead of drilling scientific holes in his head. I myself did not go into the melee, but hovered outside like the swift back in a football scrimmage, putting a bullet through on the side whenever I got a chance. I was more use so. I fired forty-nine cartridges that morning, and I did not miss many shots. Presently, do as we would, the beam of the balance began to rise against us. We had not more than fifteen or sixteen effectives left now, and the Maasai had at least fifty. Of course, if they had kept their heads and shaken themselves together, they could soon have made an end of the matter. But that is just what they did not do, not having yet recovered from their start, and some of them having actually fled from their sleeping places without their weapons. Still, by now, many individuals were fighting with their normal courage and discretion, and this alone was sufficient to defeat us. To make matters worse just then, when Mackenzie's rifle was empty, a brawny savage, armed with a sime or sword, made a rush for him. The clergyman flung down his gun, and drawing his huge carver from his elastic belt, his revolver had dropped out in the fight, they closed in desperate struggle. Presently, locked in a close embrace, missionary and Maasai rolled on the ground behind the wall. For some time, I, being amply occupied with my own affairs, and in keeping my skin from being pricked, remained in ignorance of his fate, or how the duel had ended. To and fro surged the fight, slowly turning round like the vortex of a human whirlpool, and the matter began to look very bad for us. Just then, however, a fortunate thing happened. Umslopogas, either by accident or design, broke out of the ring and engaged a warrior at some few paces from it. 
As he did so, another man ran up and struck him with all his force between his shoulders with his great spear, which, falling on the tough steel shirt, failed to pierce it and rebounded. For a moment the man stared aghast, protective armor being unknown among these tribes, and then he yelled out at the top of his voice, They are devils! Bewitched! Bewitched! And seized by a sudden panic, he threw down his spear and began to fly. I cut short his career with a bullet, and Umslopogaas brained his man, and then the panic spread to the others. Bewitched! Bewitched! they cried, and tried to escape in every direction, utterly demoralized and broken-spirited, for the most part even throwing down their shields and spears. On the last scene of that dreadful fight I need not dwell. It was a slaughter great and grim, in which no quarter was asked or given. One incident, however, is worth detailing. Just as I was hoping that it was all done with, suddenly from under a heap of slain where he had been hiding, an unwounded warrior sprang up and, clearing the piles of dying and dead like an antelope, sped like the wind up the corral towards the spot where I was standing at the moment. But he was not alone, for Umslopogaas came gliding on his tracks with the peculiar swallow-like motion for which he was noted. And as they neared me, I recognized in the Maasai the herald of the previous night. Finding that, run as he would, his pursuer was gaining on him, the man halted and turned round to give battle. Umslopogaas also pulled up. Ah! he cried in mockery to the Elmoran. It is thou whom I talked with last night, the Lagunani, the herald, the capturer of little girls, he who would kill a little girl. And thou didst hope to stand man to man and face to face with Umslovogas, an Induna of the tribe of the Makwilisini, of the people of the Amazulu. Behold, thy prayer is granted, and I didst swear to hew thee limb from limb, thou insolent dog. Behold, I will do it even now. The Messiah ground his teeth with fury, and charged at the Zulu with his spear. As he came, Umslopogaas deftly stepped aside, and swinging in Kosikas high above his head with both hands, brought the broad blade down with such fearful force from behind upon the Messiah's shoulder, just where the neck is set into the frame, that its razor edge shore right through bone and flesh and muscle, almost severing the head and one arm from the body. Oh! ejaculated Umslopogas, contemplating the corpse of his foe. I have kept my word. It was a good stroke. End of chapter 7